done, Jeremy. You must be dizzy with all that counting. Every evening it's the same. How much is there, Father? 123 pounds, some pence left over. Well, it's not changed since he started counting an hour ago. 123 pounds, but we'll never get there at this rate. How much are the debts still to be paid? Over 300. I must get another position. Oh, now, dear, be cautious. Work's hard to come by nowadays. But the school pays me so little. I should be working full time and evenings like Tom. What I put in each week is a pittance. No, I, I shall speak to Lucy. She may know someone in St. Ogg's who needs a governess or a companion. Tom, dear. Whatever is the time? What's up, boy? Uh, nothing. Uh, there was so little for me to do. I just left early, that's all. Has Uncle Dean given you notice to quit? The truth now? No, Mother, he's done nothing of the sort. On the contrary, he's been talking about giving me promotion. Oh, quite right, too, his own nephew. I'll fetch tea. Uh, no, Mother, don't go. No, somebody must fetch the tea. Has Maggie lost use of her limbs? Poor Maggie's just come in from school, Tom. Doesn't matter. I'll fetch the tea. Uh, it was a, a pity you lost that money speculating on the corn, Father. Ah, it was a sore job. <clears throat> I'll not stay above ground long enough to see things right, Tom. Yes, you shall, Father. You shall live to see your debts paid. And what's more, you shall pay them with your own hand. A good while ago, Uncle Glegg lent me some money to do some trading with a ship owner from Laysom. I've been successful, Father. I now have £320 in the bank and the prospect of more. All our debts can be paid. Oh, oh, my boy, oh, my boy. I knew you'd make everything good again. Father, are you all right? Oh, oh Father, don't. Don't. Mother, is there any brandy? There's the buffer Sister Dean brought at Christmas. Father? Uncle Dean has appointed a meeting of the creditors in the Golden Lion on the 31st. We shall all have dinner together at 2 o'clock. Uncle Gleg will be there and all. I wish you'd brought the money with your tongue for me to look at. To see it in me and... And so you shall. In the Golden Lion. God bless you, Tom. You'll make a speech, Tom, with the Golden Lion. A good speech. No, Father. You shall. Ah, you're right. I shall. A wakeum shall hear of it. Well, he must already know something. Uncle Dean advertised the creditors meeting in the messenger this morning. The lad's made amends to you, Bessie. Now you'll have some good foot back in the house. Shake hands with me, lad. It's a great thing for a man to have a good son he can be proud of. It'd be fine if wakeum had a son like I was, Bessie. A tall, straight, honest fellow, instead of that poor, crooked creature. There's nothing doing to you now, Tom. You can prosper in the world, my lad. I hope so, Father. And one day, perhaps, we'll own the mill again. Aye. And one day, maybe, you'll see Lawyer Wakeham and his puny son a rung at you below you on the ladder. And what time is Mr. Guest to arrive? At any moment. Baggy, you do like him, don't you? He's very clever. If I disapprove of him, will you give him up? Give him up? Oh, you're mocking me again. No, I suppose it is out of keeping that anyone as insignificant as I should ever be mistress of such a great mansion as Park House. People are not like snails, dear. You're not expected to be large in proportion to the house you live in. Dear Maggie, you've been such a comfort to me since Mama died. You've been a comfort to me. Until now, I've always been happy. I've never been tried in the way you have. Now then, we'll have no more sadness. I'm putting you under a discipline of pleasure while you're here today. And those clothes. Stand up. Yes, miss. I wonder if Marie Antoinette looked as good when her gown was donned at the elbow. Oh, can you see it? <laughs> I can't think what witchery it is in you that makes you look best in old clothes. 
If I wore that dress, I'd be quite unnoticeable. Oh, quite. And find yourself swept under the grate like the carpet dust. Can I sit down now, Cinderella? Well, at least you can let me change your brooch. That one looks silly on you. Won't this mar the charming effect of my consistent shabbiness? The question is, does your little brooch suit me? If Mr. Guest should see you with that trinket on, he'd be obliged to leave the room again. You'll have a fit of vapours. I think I shall wear something else, Maggie, dear. I shan't be a moment. Good morning. Good morning. I had no idea we were to have the pleasure of your company today, Miss Tulliver. Oh, I know how much you dislike to be complimented, but please allow me that one tiny courtesy, the pleasure of your company. So much fluency and self-possession should not be wasted on a private occasion, Mr. Guest. I see you've discovered how impudent I am already. As superficial people don't discern that. Due to your manner, I suppose. Shall we go for a row on the river, Miss Tulliver? Would you like that? Surely it's for Lucy to decide what we shall do. Oh, of course. Well, I did not mean that we should go for a row alone. <laughs> you must be sweet to row, Stephen. Tiny hands could never hold these oars, Lucy. No excuses now. I shall not be satisfied until I can row you and Maggie all the way to Dorcott Mill and back. Oh, no, Lucy, even Tom was never able to do that. Maggie can row, Stephen. Oh, yes, Tom taught me years ago. Well, the river suits your temperament, Miss Tulliver. Whatever can you mean? Oh, it's all part of Miss Tulliver's general uncanniness, I suppose. An ever-changing quality of witchcraft and water. Then you should liken the river to all of human nature, Mr. Guest. We all change. Certainly. Well, the floss is as full of unbridled passions as any person. But take care, this wood is treacherous when wet. Thank you. Stephen has a splendid voice, hasn't he? Maggie? Certain strains of music do affect me so. I can never hear them without changing my whole attitude of mind from the time. I wish I could always have plenty of music in my life. You really did enjoy yourself tonight. Yes. Tell me truly what you think of Steve. Good and bad. I think he should tremble more. Tremble? I think you should humiliate him a little. A lover should never be so self-confident. You think he's conceited? Yes. But you don't dislike him. How could I dislike anyone who promised to make you happy? <laughs> when you next come, Stephen has promised to bring Philip Wakeham with him. He has such a nice voice. Oh, but Lucy, I couldn't see him. Why ever not? Not without Tom's leave. I promised him I, I wouldn't see Philip without first asking permission. I had no idea Tom was such a tyrant. I shall speak to him about it. Oh, no, please don't. But I've never heard of anything so strange and unreasonable. I can understand Tom's being bitter about Mr. Wakeham, but what is he against poor Philip? Philip is in love with me. Maggie! Oh, how lovely! Oh, I'm terribly fond of Philip. Stephen and I have been to visit him once or twice lately, and he's looked so sad. I thought he was morbid about his deformity. And now I realise he was pining for you. Maggie? Does it upset you if I talk about Philip? Oh, Lucy, you are so dear to me. Let's always be such good friends. <laughs> what a strange creature you are. Of course we should always be friends. I hope so. <laughs>
Wickham. If you just wait a few moments, Mr. Wickham, Father should be home soon from the meeting at the Golden Lion. Of no consequence, I shall see him tomorrow. I imagine you have a very strange mixture of feelings towards me, Miss Tulliver. To be honest, yes. Then under the circumstances, it was good of you to ask me, and you've been most amiable. Would you be so kind as to wish your mother a good evening? Certainly. Oh, Father, Mr. Wakeham... Leave us! Oh, Mr. Wakeham was... Leave us! That was unnecessary, Tulliver. Your daughter has been most polite and courteous. What are you doing in my house? Well, I came to talk over farm matters, but I see you're in no mood for discussion. Will you please let me pass? Say your piece. You're a fool, Tulliver. Let me pass. Say your piece, Wakeham. Very well. Why didn't you remove the stones from the far close before ploughing? I told you plain enough what would happen if you didn't. But an imbecile like you never learn, do they? And find someone else to farm for you. You've been drinking, I suppose. I needed no drink to make my mind up. I serve no longer under a scoundrel like you, Wakeham. Find someone else to teach farming to. Very well, if that's the way you wish it to be, be off these premises by Monday. I shall go in my own good time. You ignorant brute, hold your tongue and let me pass. Act until I've told you what I think of you. You're too cunning to get hanged, Wakeham. But that's what you deserve. <laughs> Sorry, lass. You shouldn't have interfered. I hurt. You'll suffer for this, sir. Your daughter is a witness. You've assaulted me. Tell them all I'll thrust you, Wick. I'm showing the marks on you. You lunatic! Father! Help me to my horse, Miss Tulliver. I think my arm is broken. But are you sure you can ride in such a state? One of the men can ride with me. Go to the town, Wickham! Not across the ferry! Tell them all what I did to you! By God, I'll see you suffer for this! Good riddance! Did you, oh, yes, Father. Lie, lie I, still, dear. Oh, I've got a pain in my head, my dear. Oh, Father, I'm, I must go for the doctor. No, no, no. Don't leave me, lass. I'm not long to go. Father, what's happened? I'll pass all your way, come on. Oh, Tom, thank God. Father! Father, Tom. What's happened? Did Wakeham do this? No, Father attacked Mr. Wakeham and whipped him terribly. Is that I tried to stop him. Is that the boy? Yes, Father, it's Tom. Shake hands with me, Tom. Before I go home. I'll run for the doctor, Father. First, I must get you up to stairs no, to bed. No, no, no. I shall not get up again, Tom. This is the end. Tom? Yes, Father? You must look after your mother and my ear. Be good to him, huh? And make sure it's a brick grave for me. So your mother and me can lie together. Your fret wins. <laughs> Give us a kiss, eh? I had my turn, Tom. I beat him fair and square. Now, you must get the mill back from the Monday. I'll try, Father. Father, you forgive Mr. Wakeham now, don't you? You've beaten him, and now you forgive him. I don't forgive him. Never. Perhaps God forgives him. If God forgives rascals, he won't be hard on me.
two funerals in the family. It's more than body and soul can bear. First poor Susan, and now David Tulliver. I think not, Bessie. If Sophie weeps in equal proportions to the wine she's drinking, we shall have to take to the boat. Jane Glegg, how could you be so unfeeling? And how could you be such a hypocrite? There's nothing you enjoy more than a funeral. What's keeping neighbour Dean, I wonder? The carriage was delayed at the church, Uncle. They'll be here shortly. We should talk about the future, Bessie, whilst we're all together. What's to become of them? Why, well, we shall go on living here, of course. And Tom will help Luke with the mill. Be sensible, Bessie. Tom knows nothing of milling. And you must remember, it'll be Mr. Wakeham who'll decide who manages the mill. Softly, Jane, softly. But surely he'll let us stay on here. It's our home. Well, my dear, the word is that Wakeham's already looking round for a new manager. If he's a married man with family, as he probably will be, he will need accommodation. Oh. Well, surely you can't mean... Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Wakeham wouldn't give away our home. Where should we go? Listen, my dear, this house is his. He only allowed you to stay here whilst Tulliver managed the mill. Now he's gone. God rest his soul. Now he's gone. The new manager will have to come here in his place. But I thought perhaps now, now Jeremy's gone, Mr. Wakeham might be finished with his bitterness and be willing to sell back the mill. And who, pray, should provide the money to buy it? Well, Guest and Co, of course. I wouldn't pin your hopes on that, Bessie. Oh, but they must buy it. Mother, perhaps it would be better to wait until we're all gathered. Hmm? Uh, where's Tom? Yes, where's Tom? Well, he went to see Luke and the men. They were all at the church, you know. Wives and children, too. I see no point in funerals. All this fuss and bother won't bring Tulliver back. Jane Glegg. You can be so hard it passes all understanding. Oh, get on with your snivelling, Sophie. And poor Bessie's husband not yet cold in his grave. He's been dead for three days and no amount of weeping and wailing will make him any less dead in 20 years. <sighs> What would you say if I asked your aunt to live to come and live with us? She could manage our house very well, I think. Much better than a stranger would. And it'd give you more time to be with young Stephen. I think it's a splendid idea, Papa. Why, well, Bessie would be terribly lonely on her own. And Maggie might come with her, uh, if she wished. There's company for you. But someone must look after poor Tom. Tom is quite able to look after himself. Ah, Mother. Better be leaving. The new man will be here at any moment. I've no wish to meet him. I can't bear to turn me back on it like this. Our own. Well, we've no choice. Why couldn't Gessets have bought the mill? For the simple reason that we can outbid them. <laughs> oh, come on, Mother. Don't cry. This is our home. One day I'll bring you back here again. Just as Father said I must. But how can we ever come back? I think you'll be happy as Uncle Dean's housekeeper. Lucy's a kind little soul. And what's to become of you? I'll get lodgings. As far away as possible. Wecombe's new manager's a drunken lout. I've no wish to watch him strutting about our property in Father's boots. Ah, come on, Mother. We must go. No, you go on. I'll come directly. Jeremy, what's to become of us? By God, Phil, this is a nice place for you to work in, but I'm too stiff in the joints to climb those stairs very often. You don't often pay me a visit, Father. Oh, well, now I have. I've come to see your work. Each time I make up my mind to invade your sanctum, you're off abroad or on some sketching trip. 
Oh, what can I show you? Get a capital light from the roof. Mm. These are excellent, Phil. Really excellent. You must have enough here for a showing. I suppose so, yes. Take this one. It's as good as any London artist. What are you working on now? I thought you'd given up portraits. Those are all portraits of Miss Tulliver at different ages since I met her at school in King's Law. Have you been seeing her since you came back from abroad? Yes, I saw a great deal of her before her father's death. At Dolcott Mill? In the forest nearby. I love her father. I shall never love anyone else. Is she aware of this? She knows I love her, yes. Whether she loves me or would be prepared to marry me, I don't know. And if she would? Then I marry her. I see. So this is the return you make me for all the indulgences I've heaped on you. <laughs> You've certainly been indulgent, Father, and I'm grateful. But am I supposed to repay the debt by sacrificing all my chances of happiness? I think most sons would share their father's feelings in this case. Tulliver was a mad, ignorant brute who came within an inch of murdering me. The whole town knows it. He's dead, Father. The man's been buried almost a month. Are you really going to carry this ridiculous rancor beyond the grave? My God, is he meant to be horsewhipped by a lout and then love him for it? Of course not, but you have to extend your enmity to Maggie, to Miss Tulliver. She never entered into the family quarrels. And what does that signify? No one asks what a woman does. They asked who she belongs to, what family. And what of that insolent brother of hers? What does he think of your liaison? He's forbidden her to see me again or even to correspond with me. He's forbidden you? Oh, this is altogether too degrading, Philip. I'll not see you married to old Tulliver's daughter. You need have no fears, Father. Under the circumstances, we're not likely to get attached, are we? That cold devil Tom Tulliver is as good a mark for a bullet as I know. He's forbidden you. Bye. Miss Tulliver. No, please don't rise. Uh, your mother tells me that Lucy is out. Is that so? But surely you remember she always has a music lesson on Tuesday. Oh, of course. I'd quite forgotten. How stupid. Well, I'm very vexing. No matter. Perhaps I could keep you company until she returns. As you wish. Ah, I see you're not addicted to the fashionable vice of fancy work. I can do nothing more difficult or more elegant than shirt making. Your plain sewing is so exquisite it becomes fancy work. Thank you. Uh, Lucy tells me I'm not the sort of man that you admire. She says you find me conceited. Would it be very uncivil of me to say that I do? She also says that your sewing is quite a mystery to her, that you were very different once and hated sewing of any description. It's a mystery quite easily explained. Sewing shirts was the only way I could earn some extra money. Oh, I like that sort of defiance, Miss Tulliver. That pride of poverty that won't be ashamed of itself. Please, don't go. You're unlike any other woman I've ever met before. If you'll forgive me, Mr. Guest. Maggie! Please let go of my arm. You know, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. You know. You did this deliberately. You came here when you knew Lucy would be out. I wish to God I'd never met you, Maggie Tulliver. I'm not even sure I'd, I like you very much. <laughs> 